Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. Our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We bring you weekly topics and thought-provoking guests to get you to stop, reflect and think about what it means to be a leader in a modern world. Our aim is to help you become the leader you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Please enjoy the show. Hey everybody and welcome back to The Leadership Project where our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. Familiar followers of the show will know that we take great pride in finding really innovative thought leaders to share with us their perspectives and to challenge our thinking. And today we're in for a real treat in that regard. We are joined by John Mertz. John has had a very diverse career, starting in politics, but also working in high-tech, uh, well-established engineering organisations, and also some time within startups. He's also the founder of an organisation called Santa Fe Innovates, and he has a focus on the intersection between business and society, and has a view that business leaders are best positioned to be able to create real, sustainable and meaningful impact on society. He's also on the Advisory Council for the Centre for Leadership and Ethics with the McCombs School of Business at the University of Texas. I'm really interested to hear John's thoughts here today. We're going to have a chat about business leadership and the connection to purpose. John, without any further ado, please introduce yourself to the audience and give a little flavour of your background and what led you to be with us today. Great. Uh, Mick, thank you so much for your time and I really look forward to the conversation to today. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, you know, I kind of look at, uh, or I've started looking at my life in kind of three chapters. So I'll, I'll kind of introduce myself that way. So my first chapter, I was very intrigued by politics and uh, as a 20 something year old, uh, I got involved in that and which led me to working in Washington, D.C., uh, in the United States Senate as a legislative assistant and then an appointee in a couple of administrations as well. And that kind of led to kind of what's next. And that led to my chapter two, which uh, took me back to uh, business school to get my MBA and really led then to a focus on uh, high tech over the course of 25 years. And I've led uh, marketing and business development organizations for startups and um, as well as leading teams uh, for uh, bigger companies like IBM and uh, Deloitte. Uh, third chapter started probably about four years ago, uh, moved to Santa Fe and uh, kind of did a reset. I uh, just did two things. Uh, one, I started a doctoral program. So I'm right now in the dissertation phase of my inter interdisciplinary leadership uh, doctorate. And the second thing I did, I got very involved in economic development projects and initiatives here in Santa Fe. And that led uh, <clears throat> to about a year and a half ago to starting uh, Santa Fe Innovates. And uh, <clears throat> the focus with Santa Fe Innovates is really to work with entrepreneurs here in northern New Mexico in particular and um, focus on those entrepreneurs that want to make a difference, not only in the business that they build, uh, so from a revenue and profit perspective, but also in the purpose, whether it's a, starting as a benefit corporation or getting certified as a B Corp or having some purpose uh, in, in ingrained within their business model and in their activities as part of the startup venture. And so that's been my focus here over the last uh, few years. And actually, I guess maybe one other thing to mention is that uh, two weeks ago, I started teaching a leadership development class at the University of New Mexico Anderson School of Management. Um, so um, very excited about that to begin working with um, students as well. I'd love to have a chat to you about that at some point, John. That sounds very interesting. So you talk about purposeful leadership. You talk about businesses being very clear about their purpose and leading for impact. Tell us more about why you think that is so important. Yeah, uh, 
I'll, I'll start with kind of two thoughts around that. Uh, one is I think that, you know, um, it was the original intent, I guess, if you will. So Adam Smith, you know, is, who is viewed as being kind of the father of capitalism, if you will, um, you know, he talked a lot in the book around moral sentiments about how decisions or um, we need to take into account um, those that our decisions impact so that there is, he didn't use the word empathy, but essentially, you know, understanding um, how, how our business decisions or our other decisions are going to impact people in, in society. And so there's definitely a purpose uh, embedded from the beginning um, as far as what business should do beyond just uh, making a profit and growing revenue. I think the second part is that especially, you know, maybe this is more U.S. based, but, you know, I, you know, there's definitely issues um, in other countries as well that um, some of the, our politics and our government seems to be somewhat paralyzed on addressing issues that impact the, the long term, uh, the future of our our globe, our planet, uh, um, and just, you know, certain issues that have gone unresolved for so long. And so business leaders have shown that they can step up and fill that void, um, that they can take actions that can improve our planet or, you know, address climate uh, uh, in a positive way, um, as well as diversity and inclusion and discrimination and all those other types of tough issues. And so I think, uh, you know, if in that void, uh, somebody's got to step up and the business leaders are starting to do that. And I think uh, we're going to see more of that and they can hopefully over time too also hold the politicians more accountable uh, to their decisions and actions or inactions so that we can get better balance between business and society or business and politics again as well. There's a few things I'd like to unpack there, John, really interesting perspectives. The first one you brought up was the word capitalism. And I'm going to say that many people, when they think of capitalism, they have pictures of Gordon Gecko on the famous Wall Street movie and they think of greed and they think of the famous words, you know, greed is good, etc. And certainly that is a perspective that still exists for some that capitalism equals greed. But what I'm hearing you say is that the original intent of capitalism was not that. It was actually about having impact. Tell us more on that. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, I think, again, if greed is good, then purpose is engaging. <laughs> and that should be more of uh, a balanced effort, I guess, within uh, businesses. And so, yeah, back in, you know, at least some of my research, I guess, around Adam Smith, he had this concept of sympathy. So again, empathy, the, at least that word or that concept didn't exist um, back in those days. And it wasn't being um, sympathetic uh, to somebody necessarily, but it was, um, again, like I mentioned, you know, being able to put yourself in their place and try to understand the impact of a decision was going to have on them. It's easy for us to obviously think about the impact of a decision on ourselves I think it's more challenging to think about that impact on someone else. And he also used this concept kind of, of, of imagination. Um, you know, some may call it moral imagination. And it is, you know, using this concept of an impartial spectator. So if I can't think of an individual that's different from me, um, where this, my decision is impacting them, then I can kind of create this um, spectator and imagine what that impact would be. And so, again, I think, you know, obviously, you know, Adam Smith wrote two books, Wealth of Nations and uh, Moral Sentiments, and a lot of the tension has focused on Wealth of Nations. And, you know, uh, Milton Friedman, the University of Chicago economist, kind of took a thread of, if you will, of, in my opinion, of Wealth of Nations and kind of ran with it. And that kind of created this shareholder capitalism view for many years. I think what gives me hope on the stakeholder capitalism side of things is that you know, it took uh, probably about 20 years for shareholder capitalism to really take hold and and change the way businesses and, and, and uh, operated within our society. And so with stakeholder capitalism, you know, we're probably only, you know, five years into it, if you will. <laughs> so, you know, it's easy to get discouraged, maybe not to see uh, as much positive traction, but I think there is reasonable traction and, and I think there's a lot more to come. So, 
knowing that it took a while for um, shareholder capitalism to take hold, you know, we still have a, a ways ahead to really get a stakeholder at, uh, capitalism to, to show more results and get more people on, on the board to join that momentum that not only do consumers want, I believe, but I believe the next generation of business leaders really want to try to manage and lead that way as well. I like this pivot and this conversation that we're having here, John, and the difference between shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism. So we think of shareholder capitalism about being a return on investment, a fiscal return on investment, earnings per share and the bottom line and all of these things. What's your definition of stakeholder capitalism? Yeah, it's a it's a broader view. So yes, shareholders are important, and profit is important, and 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 you know all the operational and financial aspects of a business. Because without that, you know, obviously you're not going to be able to operate. But as important are the employees, um, your partners, your customers, uh, the citizens in your communities. Um, each of them play a role uh, within your company as well. And so it's, it takes an added effort uh, from a leadership perspective to understand uh, some of the different perspectives of those key stakeholders on a decision or a direction of a company. But when they do, um, I think, you know, at least I don't have all the statistics off the top of my head, but I know there's been some research done where if there's more of a focus on those types of elements that they're as financially successful, if not more so than ones that are just focused on uh, shareholder capitalism. And I think just from, you know, if I, not to go off on a tangent too much, but, um, you know, as it relates to shareholder capitalism, unfortunately, I think one of the things that kind of took hold, especially over the last decade or so, is almost this kind of hero CEO or hero leaders that, um, that you know, we need to pay somebody a lot of money because they know what they're doing and they're going to take the company in this better direction than, than anything anybody else could. And so, you know, we've got now this, especially in the United States, this uh, CEO to worker um, pay uh, discrepancy, you know, it's, you know, 250 to th- or 300 to one. And that um, not having a more of a 50 to one <laughs> or a 100 to one, you know, type ratio, that creates a lot of inequity within our society, uh, not, let alone our businesses. And so there needs to you know, be some readjustments, some hard ones that are going to need to happen. And we're going to need boards and governance to take a uh, better hold of that and to try to shift things to where it's more reasonable. Um, you know, in other countries like UK or Germany, I know the ratios are more in that kind of 50 to 100 to 1 ratio. And so, there, you know, there's definitely going to be some hard um, uh, turning points that need to happen to really have stakeholder capitalism take hold. And, you know, this, this is where, you know, you know, real leadership, if you will, um, needs to step up and real governance, governance needs to step up as well. Mm. I think when we get to those levels, those multiples that you're talking about, it becomes very diff- difficult for self-interest not to overtake collective interest. I think that's part of the issue there. Coming back to your point about the financial performance, I think the other part between shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism would be that with a sole focus on shareholder returns, that you can end up in a situation where the business is making short-term decisions. What is it that keeps the share price up? Is it our quarter-end results? Is it our year-end results, et cetera? Whereas a stakeholder capitalism approach is most likely going to have a better long-term vision and make better long-term decisions that result in the longevity of the business and the long-term profitability of the business. That's where I think the secret is. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely agree. And if you listen to some of the conversations that the Business Roundtable has had, so Business Roundtable represents about a 200 of largest uh, corporations, um, and they issued a statement about 18 months ago or so about r- the focus of a corporation should be on stakeholders, not just shareholders. And I mean, if you look, listen or read about some of the commentary or and how that transition is going, I guess, 
you know, it is about shorter termism versus long termism. And so I think the business roundtable leaders understand the importance of have a long, having a longer term vision and direction for a company is going to be able to build more shareholder value, but it's also going to probably um, build greater employee engagement, kind of going back to the point of, you know, employee engagement being extremely low, um, you know, making decisions more for the long term sh should also impact employee engagement. And because it's going to build, hopefully, I guess there's two part, parts to that. One is that, you know, as a business leader, if you're going to focus more on, on the long term, you really need to have the vision that there's different stakeholders that have collaborated on, agree on, and know that and are inspired by that vision and really willing to do the work uh, to achieve that longer term vision. So trust is, I think, part of that. And then with trust, then, you know, I think at least from uh, research I've read um, where there is a high trust organization, engagement is in the 70s, not the 30s. And so, you know, when there is that trusted relationship between the leaders and the workers or um, among the stakeholders for a company, knowing and inspired by that longer term vision, you know, they'll get better engagement within the company, which would lead to better productivity, which would, you know, likely lead to better financial performance as well. You're saying so many things there that resonate so strongly with us at the at the Leadership Project and with me personally, I have to say, John. The employee engagement part, the first thing I want to say to all of the business leaders listening to this podcast is for any business to have real impact on the world, whether it be societal impact or even just your profits and your bottom line, you need to be able to scale. The only way that you can scale is through strong employee engagement with employees that are highly motivated, very engaged in the business and very productive. The one CEO getting the big salary that John was talking about before cannot achieve any of the things that they achieve without an engaged workforce. And what I'm feeling more and more every day, John, is that people want to work for organizations that have a clear purpose and make a real impact on the world. I study heavily millennials and Gen Y and Gen Z people. I'm a Gen X myself. I already had that in me. I want to work for a company that is very purpose-driven. But I think as the generations go, that is dramatically increasing with millennials and Gen Z being their number one criteria is to work for a company with purpose and other things come second. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the studies from the Edelman Trust Barometer, you know, definitely back that up. I mean, not only do they want to work for those types of companies, they expect business leaders to, to deliver more than profit. They deliver, they want them to deliver societal good as well. And so I think you're right, uh, you know, both millennials and Gen Z, are wanting to see those changes happen. You know, millennials are becoming more and more in leadership positions. And, you know, my hope is that we'll begin to see more tangible efforts in that. You know, if you look at, um, you know, here with the pandemic, you know, there's been some discussions about the great resignation, right? About people not, um, or leaving their jobs. I mean, I think in May alone in the United States, there was like, I think five or 6 million people left their jobs in, in May just uh, alone. And if you look at some of the statistics right now, anyway, you know, part of it is, you know, relating to the work conditions, you know, what kind of flexibility uh, team members want um, in between their work and life. Um, and I, you know, I think there is purpose. I think uh, it's, it seems to be a strong thread within that as well. Not only what uh, individuals want out of um, how they spend their time at work, um, but also I think the types of companies that they, you know, want to work uh, for and with. You know, pay is definitely a part of it, but I think, you know, um, you know, work flexibility is a part of it. But I think it's uh, probably more than that, too, that they really want to be work for an organization that uh, is that they can trust and that they're a trusted part of that um, organization as well. You know, so I think, you know, to a certain degree, it goes back to stakeholder capitalism in the sense that, you know, if you're going to have more uh, holistic leadership, uh, leaders that understand um, the different perspectives of different uh, stakeholders and, and are able to 
work through those tensions and those challenges and do it in a way that you know, you're never going to make everybody happy, but if most people understand why those decisions are being made and how those detentions are resolved and it fits with a, a vision of um, profit and purpose, then I think most would probably, you know, get on board with that type of approach and, and want to be with that type of company as well. You've brought up the word trust several times already. Tell us about the connection between purpose and trust. Yeah, I think there's, you know, you can look at it as self-trust maybe first. I mean, that's probably a good place to to begin. I mean, I think you, you know, as an individual leader or, or contributor or team member, uh, you have to have a certain confidence in what resonates with you, what's important to you, and how you want to show up in the workplace and in community and family life um, and in contributing in a, in a positive way. I think, uh, you know, there was uh, an article written about the uh, enemies of trust, and it uh, um, referred to kind of three areas of trust. There was, um, let me see if I remember them all now, but it was org- organizational trust, there was strategic trust, and I believe it was, um, a, you know, kind of that personal trust as well. And so, you know, going back to the importance of having an inspiring vision, so that's kind of the strategic trust, right? Do you really believe in what the business leaders are saying about where they want to take the organization? And is that something you want to be a part of? I think the organizational trust obviously is equally important part of that because that's really the organizational culture, right? And if you don't trust that it's going to be an equitable, fair, engaging, um, collaborative, you know, type organizational culture, then yeah, you're probably going to be one of those, you know, 60, 70% that are somewhat disengaged or very disengaged within that organization. Which, which isn't healthy for anybody in that situation. So, you know, so I think, you know, again, I think, yeah, I think you have to look at it in a whole, whole trust in a holistic way that, you know, you do have to have a certain amount of self-trust, but then you need to have uh, trust within the organization that you're working with and working for, or that you're building as a leader, um, as well as then the direction of that uh, organization as well. So let me try and pull some of those threads together and I'd like your feedback on this summary. So people want to work for a company with purpose. They want to feel that what they do is having a meaningful impact and that what they do matters. Building and maintaining trust is then having a company that not only has that purpose and has that vision, but they live that purpose and they live that vision and that the actions that they make on a day-to-day business basis are consistent with the values, beliefs, purpose and vision of the company. And whenever the actions do not match, that kills trust. And when the actions do match, it builds trust. Your thoughts? Absolutely. I mean, I think it goes to credibility, right? Um, if you're going to be a credible leader or a credible organization, um, you have to, you know, live your values. You got to lead with that. If uh, team members see an inconsistency or customers see an inconsistency um, or a shallowness of it, you know, they're going to call you out. You know, that's maybe one of the few benefits of uh, social media these days is that it enables uh, employees and others to have more an active voice in holding business leaders accountable. So if they're talking about, you know, diversity and inclusion, but their actions aren't showing that, you know, the employees today are going to speak up and stand up or walk out, as in the case with Google uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, you know, I think, you know, that kind of, in my opinion, kind of goes back to stakeholder capitalism again. You know, employees and other stakeholders have a real voice in guiding and holding businesses accountable, um, you know, to stakeholder capitalism. You know, if, if I'm a company, a Fortune 500 company that says, yes, I'm adopting uh, stakeholder capitalism, and they're not, then, you know, the employees, the customers, the shareholders too, now can uh, step up and voice their opinion. And we're starting to see more of that, I think, with you know, around the ESG type things, um, you know, both from an investor standpoint, as well as what uh, individuals are looking for in other organizations. But I think, you know, um, again, not to get off on a tangent, but I think, 
it's easy to forget the G and ESG, right? Which is the governance side of it. And so as a business leader, you need to be cognizant of that. You need to, you know, think of all stakeholders. So shareholders don't necessarily take on a lesser role if you're pursuing stakeholder capitalism, but um, it's more of a balanced view. And so the point being is that, you know, uh, I, my, my hope is, I guess, that we'll see stronger governance within many companies, um, as well as with, among the stakeholders to keep business leaders honest in their values that they're stating, um, either as part of their company direction and purpose, or even their individual um, values that they're trying to live out and how they lead. Nice summary there, John. And uh, don't be concerned about tangents. People that listen to this show often will know that I love tangents and they're, they're very good. So <laughs> that's I, where I, you get to explore the edges of things. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, and I always look looking to have, uh, you know, more challenging and thought provoking conversations. So thank you for that. Some things that I picked up from what you said in the age of social media, everyone does have a voice and everyone does have a platform now to be able to get that voice heard. That does have the ability to build up more openness and transparency, which I think can be a very good thing. There are some things about social media that we've spoken about on the show that are are not as good, things like comparison, things like algorithmic bias, etc. But having platforms for openness and transparency I think is a good thing. And then the knock-on effect of that when we talk about trust and anything that kills trust then you'll find employees voting with their voice, voting with their feet as they leave the organisation and you'll have customers voting with their wallets if they see a company that says one thing and does another. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, we really have seen that, you know, both from a customer's perspective as well as an uh, employee uh, perspective as well. I mean, when um, it's a smaller company, but it's a good example. So there's a company called Basecamp, and I think it was three or four months ago where they kind of dictated a policy of no more discussion of politics or or other issues. You know, focus on your business. Uh, the company companies should not be involved in um, or don't have a social impact. Is kind of essentially the the message that they sent. At least from what I've read, you know, I think close to half the people of the company left um, after that, or they and they were given an opportunity, maybe you know, to get packages, whatever, to do that. If they don't agree with that, you know. And it, you know, to me, it was just disappointing for a number of reasons. One is, you know, Jason Fried, uh, you know, is an author and and the head of that company, and you know, has been had been kind of recognized, I think, as a generally a progressive uh, business leader, and so it was somewhat surprising uh, to see that type of pronouncement. But they, in, this, in my opinion, it's, it was short-sighted. I mean, every company has a social impact, whether they want to admit it or not. Um, how you pay and treat people has a social impact. If you're not treated well or paid well, guess what? That's going to impact your family life when you go home. It's going to impact how you, you know, deal with your neighbors or get to know your neighbors or not. If you're not happy and satisfied and fulfilled at work, it's going to impact how you feel when you go home. Um, and in your communities where you live. And so every company has a social impact, in my opinion. Um, you know, and again, as we've talked already, that, you know, some companies are stepping up more to have a more of a social impact, whether it's on the environment or on a diversity and inclusion uh, type of issues. Um, so, you know, to, to me, the base level social impact of any company is how you treat and pay people um, in a in a equitable and fair way, and and you know and that's the low bar. Everything above that, you know, you know, we should do more than um, just that. And many business leaders are starting to do that. But you know, to to say that a company doesn't have a social impact is just uh, it is nonsense. That was a nice example that you gave there, and I think it's a good opportunity to segue back to one of the first things that you said. You've had a career where you have started out in politics and then moved out into commercial world. You've also said that business leaders are better positioned to have societal impact than politicians. Can you explain that a little further? 
Sure. So uh, two points, I guess, before getting into that. Um, one is that businesses have always been involved in politics. <laughs> it was just a little bit more hidden in the sense that it was lobbying dollars or hiring lobbyists to take on issues and try to you know, get government to do things that were positive for that business. So, you know, the notion that businesses shouldn't be involved in politics, you know, if that's true, then, you know, we need to change a lot of laws um, because it's been happening for, for decades. Um, secondly, is that, you know, at least here in the United States, there's a great book written that's called We the Corporations by Adam Winkler, who's a UCLA law professor. And it talks about how uh, companies, corporations got civil rights in the United States long before uh, blacks, women, other minority groups. And so in my view, you know, with those uh, civil rights come responsibilities. And so, um, you know, business leaders need to step up. You know, the, I think the other part that's kind of missed in a lot of the conversations is that, you know, again, going back to stakeholders, but in particular, well, all of them really, but customers and employees, you know, they're citizens of different communities. And if there's laws or regulations that are negatively impacting them and their families, then the business leaders should do something to try to address that. You know, there's been examples of, you know, where some states tried to pass uh, gender discrimination um, laws or, um, or, you know, other things that kind of limited, you know, someone's right and, and freedoms. And business leaders stood up and, you know, we were largely successful in stopping a lot of those or overturning some of those state um, uh, laws and regulations from taking effect. And so I think, you know, going back to kind of empathy or, or thinking about um, our decisions and how they impact others, we need to think more about that. You know, unfortunately, you know, empathy <laughs> seemed to just to become, I should just understand the people that are like me, not the people that are unlike me. And that's not empathy at all. And that's definitely not what Adam Smith talked about as far as being the impartial spectator. We should be thinking about people unlike us and the impact of those decisions that we are making on them. And if we do that, then, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm making up this word or not, but I call it integrative empathy. We need to have more of that um, rather than just trying to cater to those that are like us. Even if it is a made up word, I love it, John. I love everything <laughs> you've just said. What I'm hearing is the need for lobbying for the right reasons. So instead of lobbying for something that is generating profits for the company, lobbying for things that stand up for the rights of your people, caring for your people, truly caring for your people. And beyond that, with your integrative empathy, caring for those that may not have the power to care for themselves. So speaking up for the people that don't have a strong voice in the community. Absolutely. I think just like we were talking about earlier that, you know, companies having a social impact and as far as how you treat them and, and pay them within, uh, you know, within your business, you know, it's the other way around too. So in society, you have certain your, of your employees are, are feeling like they can't be who they are, they can't love who they want to love, um, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, they're not going to be, they're going to feel threatened, they're going to feel um, that they can't um, be the type of person, the type of leader you know, within, whether it's in their neighborhoods or even within their company. I, my point is that it kind of flows the other way. And so, I, you know, business leaders, you know, I think some maybe understand that, um, that if there's negative uh, state and national regulation on certain types of citizens within communities, that's going to impact them at work. And so, and then also to your point that, you know, if the business leader has a bigger voice and can help prevent some of that um, versus, you know, the impact on that uh, individual, then, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do regardless, but it also probably makes good business sense to do it too, because um, by not having a threatened employee, they're going to feel more engaged, more willing to be themselves and to uh, contribute more fully uh, within their company as well. So standing up for what's right, doing what's right, standing up for what's right, but then having a positive business impact as a result anyway. 
it's probably a good time for me to say this, and I'd like your view on this, John, because we've been saying a lot of things about profit and potentially coming across as being negative against profit. And I want to address that and say that profits are not in themselves evil. In fact, profits help fuel the very impact that we're talking about. So this isn't an anti-profit thing. It's about using those profits for the right reason, not just an inflated bank balance, but using the fuel then to create even more impact. What's your reflection on that, John? Oh, absolutely. I mean, profit is not a dirty word. It's not, um, you know, maybe greed is, <laughs> probably is, but profit isn't. And there's a difference, right? Um, yes, just as you point out, profit, you know, enables you to invest in the longer term vision that's going to be healthy for the company. You know, that can be in new products, uh, new solutions, new technologies, uh, new innovations. It can also be in employee well being, it can be in education programs to develop people. Um, there's other ways, you know, to invest than, um, you know, it, you know, you, you need some investments in some sense around um, the different stakeholders that are important to you, to your business. And so the only thing that's going to make those investments are, are your profits. And, you know, by making those investments um, across those different um, dimensions, you know, hopefully your profit will just get healthier so they can make even more investments then. Um, to keep things, the company, a place where people want to stay, work, and contribute to. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think there, you know, there shouldn't be too much debate around the role of profit in a business. You know, growth, you know, you can have a little bit more of debate, you know, is it growth at all costs? Is it growth at, you know, at what, you know, determining what is the right the growth rate of a company from a revenue uh, perspective? Um, but, you know, profit is, is a necessity to, to make everything else work. That's the ultimate desire, I think. It's the virtuous cycle. Profit fueling impact, impact fueling profit, profit fueling impact. And if we can keep that cycle going, that's when we've got a healthy society and a healthy economy all at the same time. We speak a lot about business leaders being faced with moral dilemmas, whereas you speak in some of your writing, you speak about having moral courage or sometimes you even infer to moral obligation. What does moral courage mean to you? Yeah, I think, it, you know, to me it really means that uh, when faced with um, certain tensions within a business or within life, um, that they're resolved by looking at um, certain virtues or, you know, again, morality in the sense that what's going to be the, the best decision for as, as many as possible um, in, in that um, uh, element. So, that, you know, there's, there's definitely some tension that's going on that needs to be resolved. And there's probably, in most likely cases, some easier decisions to make, but they may not be the best decisions uh, in the, well, even definitely probably not in the long term, but maybe not even in the short term. It may just kind of hope you might kind of duck to make sure, maybe, maybe with the hope that it passes, but the reality is it's not going to. So, you know, you need to make those tough decisions um, in resolving those tensions. And, you know, it is going to take a certain amount of moral courage to do that. It's going to take moral courage to understand the two differing values and exploring those with uh, those involved uh, to really try to understand the different positions. And then it's going to, you know, take the effort to kind of discern, you know, what's going to be the best decision based on those differing values. How, is there a way, at, if at all possible, to kind of honor both values? I mean, you can't do it necessarily equally, but is there a way still to honor the other side of that, of that tension-filled issue? Um, but resolving it that may lead one way more one way than the other uh, in that specific decision. And I think, it, you know, uh, you know, some of my research, I guess, will kind of give more insights into this as I as I go. But, you know, to me, it kind of seems like, you know, at certain times, if you're taking those two different tensions and resolving them and and, uh, and maybe honoring one value a little bit more than the other, um, maybe next time a similar issue comes around, it makes sense to go the other way as far as honoring the other value and then resolving that, that secondary tension. 
so I think, you know, to, to me, kind of the point is that um, it, it is that approach of resolving those tensions and figuring out how to do that in a way that is not just self-interest filled, but um, looking at it from, like I said, kind of honoring both values, but in working with the different groups that are representing those differing values to try to figure out the best way forward uh, and honoring both as much as possible. I think I it, does that make sense or? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. And, and if I can kind of summarize it a little bit, leaders are faced with challenging decisions on a day-to-day basis. And it does become an element of balancing multiple elements But I think having that moral compass and staying true to your values and beliefs and having that North Star as to what your purpose is uh, and thinking about impact, yeah, and you may have to make some challenging decisions that trades off one factor over another, but over a longer period of time, make sure those things are in balance. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe a kind of an example of this the, that may help, I guess, is that so Dick Sporting Goods uh, is a uh, sporting goods retailing company here. And, um, you know, uh, they sold guns, right? And, you know, a number of years ago after the shootings that were at uh, the Parkland High School, uh, you, know, the, and, you know, the CEO of Dick Sporting Goods was like, kind of came to a reckoning, you know, do we continue to sell guns and keep the minimum um, levels of, of who we sell guns to, or do we step up and try to make a difference? And so one of their first actions was that they raised the age to 21 as far as who they would sell guns to, and then they stopped selling um, automatic rifles um, as well. You know, they lost some employees because of that. They've probably lost some um, customers because of that. And I think now today, I don't think they sell guns at all in their stores, you know, and, you know, it was a tough decision, right? It, it was a kind of resolving that social and um, economic uh, tension of do we sell guns or not? And who do we sell them to? You know, fortunately, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure there was, you know, analysis done and so on, you know, as part of this decision that made, but, you know, longer term, you know, they they did win financially as well, um, kind of in that move, because they start carrying other types of goods that maybe were more profitable, more growth uh, within it. Um, and they seem to you know, be able to definitely take the hit, if you will, um, in making that decision and, and feeling it financially and, and through some stakeholders. But over the long term, it's, you know, it seemed like it, you know, mm. it ended up being a good financial decision, too. Um, so, you know, there is a balance just like there is with stakeholders, right, between trying to, you know, you can't just favor one over the other, but there may be times where you have to make those tough trade-offs and it may take a short-term um, impact on you financially within your company. But if it's, uh, you know, the right decision, then, you know, things will correct and you'll probably be better off than you were um, during that challenging point in time. Yeah, that's a great example, John. Thanks for sharing that. That one gives us a lot to think about and is a good example of exactly those moral decisions that CEOs sometimes need to make. We've spoken a lot about senior leadership, executive leadership, CEO activism so far. We touched earlier about employees. Tell me more about your thoughts on the role of employee activism. Yeah, I think it's a. I think it's a positive thing. I mean, I think. Um, I think there's a couple of things. One is, I think you know, accountability again. Going back to governance, you know, it is um, more than just the board of directors. You know, customers and employees, in particular, can hold um, executives accountable for their actions or inactions on on different issues. I mean, we've seen it from, you know, issues of uh, sexual harassment with like Google. We've seen it with uh, the use of artificial selling artificial intelligence uh, to the military with uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and and others. Um, you know, we've seen it with um, immigration issues as well. So, you know, I think it opens the conversation. Um, 
I, and it's an, it's an important accountability check that business leaders need to be more active in. You know, I believe that, you know, employees uh, should be given a seat on the board of directors, you know, just like it happens in Germany. Um, I think business leaders need to step up to that and um, really build that in as part of their governance structure um, as well. And I think the other thing that's kind of missing, I guess, from a business leadership perspective, um, you know, you can't spend company time, obviously, you know, solving every issue <laughs> under the sun. But if there's issues that are that are resonating front and center within um, a society, um, whether it's during lunchtime or after hours or however the business wants to do it, having an open um, conversation around some of the tough issues that countries or states are facing is a productive thing. It's not to change anybody's mind one way or the other, but I think it's to present um, and discuss the different views so that people kind of leave that um, conversation better informed, um, better insights, maybe a little bit more empathy. Again, the point is not to change their minds, but it's really to make them uh, hopefully guide them to you know understand the issue a little bit more, become better citizens, which you know, I think, again, flows back to the company um, and how they feel about that organization, but also in their own personal and family life as well. Yeah, I think open dialogue is always something to be encouraged. Some of the tricky ground can be some of the more emotive territory um, where you might end up in a situation where people are taking emotional stands instead of uh, just being open-minded and and willing to listen to the others. But I think as a general rule, having open dialogue is a is a very positive thing, diversity of thought. Yeah. Mm. Okay. You, when we talk about employees, uh, there's something about our audience is that we have leaders from all walks of life listen to the show. Some of them are CEOs, some of them are senior managers, some of them are middle managers. Many of them are new leaders, like so they've, they've graduated from being individual contributors to being a team leader for the first time and basically progressing on their career. Any advice that you could give to a leader who might be somewhere on that ladder and they see the company diverting away from their values, beliefs and vision? What should a leader do in that situation? Keep in mind that they're also taking care of the people in their team. They probably are passionate about the company they work for. If they do see a deviation from purpose, a deviation from values and beliefs, what is your advice? Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, I think having conversations with um, the leaders that you report up into um, to have raise those concerns, have that conversation, you know, hopefully they would be open to that and they would, um, you know, begin to look at how to make some positive changes to address some of those concerns. I think if that doesn't, you know, kind of resolve in a, you know, reasonable way, then I think, you know, taking the action that we've seen, you know, whether it's, you know, petitions being signed by employees uh, calling on their business leaders to make the the change or, you know, if it gets to the point where it has to result in a protest, then I think that's all, um, you know, on the table. You know, I th it's tough, obviously, you know, if you're um, an ind individual contributor leader or, you know, you know, financial decisions come into play on that too, right? Um, you know, and you know, in some business courses, at least when I was going through, they always talked about having enough money to to walk away. So that if you came across an ethical situation within a, a company um, and that it couldn't be resolved in an ethical way, that, you know, you weren't going to get it pulled into it or be a part of it, that you had the financial, um, you know, base anyway to be able to walk away from it and find a better company that would make better ethical decisions. Again, I know that's tough, too, to build that kind of financial equity to be able to do that. But I think it's an important, you know, element uh, within this conversation to, that people need to, 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 to think about. You know, I think part of it, too, is, you know, I think, you know, as an individual leader, you need to think about, you know, what are the values that are important to you? You know, what is your leadership philosophy? Um, and, you know, 
thinking through maybe some of those um, scenarios of possibilities where words don't match actions or actions don't match words <laughs> that, um, you know, what are you going to do uh, when those types of situations arise? And so I think thinking a little bit longer term as an individual leader is important, um, just as it is for, a, you know, a business leader. And so I think that, that helps, I think, set your compass, um, but also it may lead you to make, you know, some financial decisions that give you that flexibility to walk away if you need to. Really interesting perspective, John. I'm going to give a little forecast here and I want you to challenge me on it and see what you think. So we've had generations of people where there has been low levels of engagement in the workplace, but potentially generations of people that didn't have a lot of choice. They had mortgages to pay, bills to pay, families to feed, etc. So they potentially end up in jobs that are not a perfect fit to their own values, beliefs and purpose but they have to stick with it until they can find something better because of the obligations that they've got in their personal life. I mentioned before that with millennials and Gen Z, Gen Z in Australia, but Gen Z for for Americans, that they are more purposeful. They are looking for more direction-focused organisations, ones that are making a, a real impact. But the other thing is they're not as materialistic. They're not buying cars. They're not buying houses uh, to the same extent that the generations did before. So they may be in a better position to be more free-willed. And if they end up in an organisation where they join them for a purpose and find that that purpose doesn't match what they originally thought it was, that it's probably not as hard for them to leave as it was for the previous generations that had large mortgages to pay. Any thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, yeah, but, you know, again, if you read the statistics and so on, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, it's more about the experiences. I think whether that's in life or work, um, that is the focus versus material things. And so hopefully that leads to, you know, some greater, you know, financial savings to, to build those cushions. You know, I think there's, you know, kind of along with that, at least from some of the statistics I remember, I mean, I think there's, you know, even more of a desire for the younger generations to retire early. I know, in my opinion, retire is kind of an old term that's, you know, that needs to be uh, put away because it's <laughs> retire, you know, retirement, like we maybe your our parents or grandparents knew it, um, isn't really relevant, I think, in today's world. But um but I hope that translates to, you know, good financial decisions that enable them to, you know, live the type of purposeful, purposeful life that they want to. Um, you know, it's tough to do. I mean, and, and, you know, as you point out, you know, not every segment of society is going to be able to do that. But hopefully, you know, with better employment practices and other things that, you know, we provide a better base um, for more people than than there is today. And I think, you know, part of the, you know, I, not again, one of these tangents, I guess, but uh, I wish there was more focus on in, in high schools in particular, and even in college on uh, personal uh, uh, finance so that there's better awareness of good financial decisions that individuals and families need to think about. Um, I think their earlier education on that, obviously parents can play a role in that too, uh, no doubt. But, you know, I think the school systems uh, can definitely contribute to that, which hopefully then would provide um, an opportunity for more people to build that financial base so that if they are confronted with an ethical disconnect or a purpose disconnect, that they have some cushion to be able to find another opportunity to that's a, that is a better fit. That's really interesting. I was just listening to Robert Kiyosaki the other day. He was on Chandler Bolt's. Uh, podcast and he was talking about this. So my view is I'm disappointed in the lack of education about leadership in our university systems. And uh, it's interesting what I heard you say before about the course that you're starting. I think that's wonderful. So one of my things has been, why aren't we teaching leadership in the school system? 
And Robert's one was, well, we don't teach financial acumen either in the school system. We teach domain skills. We don't teach so many life skills. And leadership is a life skill. Looking after your personal finances is a life skill. And I think that's something for us all to think about. That's probably a nice point for us to come towards a close, John. And I'm going to go with some rapid fire questions here to bring us to a close. The first one, um, can you tell us of a leadership book that has changed your life? What's your favourite leadership book and how did it impact you? Boy, that's a... (laughs) Um, you know, I, I think I, one I would mention is uh, it's called Integrity by Dr. Henry Cloud. And, um, you know, for me, it, it came at, uh, as a, a good book to when you are faced with some of these ethical dilemmas, you know, it really put the focus on what kind of wake you're leaving in your in your life and thinking about it more in longer term. And so anyway, Integrity by Dr. Henry Cloud would be a book I would recommend. Okay, nice one. Do you have a favorite quote? Boy, uh, <laughs> uh, that's a good question too. I mean, I, I'm horrible at the, those types of things like remembering songs or quotes or whatever, but here's a simple one that definitely resonates with me is that um, if you can, you ought, which goes to uh, Emmanuel Kant um, and talking about ethics and, and making those types of decisions. Very good. And can you think of a inspirational leader that you always think of that kind of forges who you are today? Yeah, there's, there's two. I'll do a his, um, historical one, I guess, and, and maybe a current one. Um, one is Theodore Roosevelt. I've always been somebody I've read a lot about. Um, you know, no leader is perfect, um, but, you know, he really kind of embodied, I think, the speeder, spirit of a leader um, and trying to engage different groups and and really try to change things. Um, very progressive, thinking about the environment, thinking about um, the global society, not just the local. Um, so I think, you know, just that perspective and how um, he led um, to me is inspiring. You know, a business leader that, um, you know, inspires, you know, I, you know, think is kind of a good example of some of the CEO activists, Mark Benioff with Salesforce. I mean, he's being able to successfully grow a company um, a profitable company, but also at the same time, really try to build a culture that uh, gives back um, and also take on tough issues in society and not and is unafraid to raise his voice uh, to try to prevent um, policies that are discriminatory. Okay, very good. Challenging one. Based on what you know about the Leadership Project and our vision and mission, who do you think we should interview next? <laughs> Mark Benioff. <laughs> Mark Benioff. Great answer. All right. Very good. Okay. So, so a question um, that we ask all of our uh, guests, John, what's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? Yeah. You know, I think part of it is that um, is thinking about the, the long haul. Um, you know, I think when, especially in your, your twenties, you can get a little, or at least I was, you know, kind of impatient sometimes on things or, you know, wanting to have, um, you know, more of an impact earlier on and, and, and those types of things. But I think it's important to have more of a longer perspective on how things evolve. I mean, just like, you know, I talked about, you know, it wasn't until 15 years ago or so I started thinking of my life in chapters and. I think that's an important thing to do. I wish I would have been thinking more about that back in my 20s and knowing that there's maybe a certain transition or transformational points in life that um, may make sense to, to do, um, that I'm not going to be on just the same track um, that I think I'm on in my 20s. Nice advice. I really appreciate that, John. And final question, if any of our audience would like to get in contact with you and learn more about what you do, how do they find you? Yeah, the best place is my, my website. It's uh, johnmertz.com, J-O-N-M-E-R-T-Z.com. I'm also on Twitter, same, uh, just at John Mertz as well. Uh, so those are probably the, the two, two best places. 
Excellent. And we're going to put those details in the show notes for anyone that's looking for the easy path of just clicking it so that you make sure that you get the addresses correct. So thank you so much, John. This has been an amazing conversation. I love talking about this topic. It's one that's near and dear to my heart. I loved hearing your perspectives. I learned a lot and I know that our audience will as well. So thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate make the time and the questions and really am grateful that you are doing what you're doing in the world to uh, build better leaders. So thank you for all your good work. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for listening to the Leadership Project podcast at mixbeers.com. I'm your host, Mick Spears. Sound design and editing by Faris Sadek. Social media by Gerald Calibo. And special thanks to our operations manager, Say Spears. We appreciate you and we appreciate your time today. You can catch the video podcast and our series of shorter videos by subscribing to the Leadership Project YouTube channel. And you can join the conversation at our Facebook community group. We look forward to bringing you another great interview next week as we learn together and lead together. In the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.